Welcome to N2 Electrical Trade Theory, and we'll be taking a look at a brand new syllabus. And uh, don't forget to like and to share these videos. Now, this is going to be quite a long video because there's a lot of work to cover in each module. And in this first module, we'll be taking a look at alternating current circuit theory. And this makes up 12% of the weighting of the national exam paper. Dynamically induced EMF is produced as a result of physical motion. Just the background to N1, conventional current flows from positive to negative. Electron flows from negative to positive. Direct current flows in one direction only. Alternating current is current that reverses direction of flow many times per second at regular intervals. Electromagnetic induction is the process of producing EMF due to a changing magnetic field. In terms of Faraday's first law, an EMF is induced whenever there is a change in flux. Faraday's second law states that the size of the induced EMF depends on the rate at which the flux is cut. There are different types of electromagnetic induction, and in this module, we'll be taking a look at dynamically induced and statically induced. Under statically induced EMF, we get self-induced EMF and mutually induced EMF. Just some basic definitions for inductance. EMF is induced in a coil due to the change in magnetic flux. Dynamically induced EMF produced as a result of physical motion. Statically induced. EMF is statically induced when no physical motion is needed to produce EMF. Self-induced, alternating current passes through a single coil. The magnetic field generates an EMF in the same coil. Mutually induced, alternating current through one coil causes a magnetic field to induce an EMF in the second coil. Let's take a look at these definitions in practice. To produce an EMF or a sine wave, we take a coil, we rotate it through the lines of flux running from north to south. To calculate the EMF, we say the magnetic flux density in Tesla multiplied by the length of the conductor in meters, multiplied by the rate at which the conductor cuts the flux in meters per second, multiplied by sine theta. In our very first example, an armature conductor is 425 millimeters long. It is rotated at a velocity of 20 meters per second inside of a flux density of 1.95 Tesla. So therefore, to generate an EMF in part one, calculate the EMF induced when the conductor is at 45 degrees to the magnetic field. We substitute 45 into sine theta, multiply by the flux density of 1,95 Tesla. The length converted to meters is 0 0,425 meters. And the rate at which the conductor cuts the lines of flux is 20 meters per second. Therefore, at 45 degrees, we generate an EMF of 11,72 volts. In part two, calculate the EMF induced when the conductor is at right angles to the magnetic field. At right angles, which is either 90 degrees or 270 degrees, we will produce maximum EMF. So we substitute 90 degrees into sine theta, multiply by the flux density, the length of the conductor in meters and the velocity, and we end up with a maximum EMF of 16,575 volts. To calculate the EMF when the conductor is at 180 degrees to the magnetic field, no EMF is induced. Let's prove this. At 180 degrees, we substitute that into sine theta, multiply by the flux density, the length of the conductor in meters, and 20 meters per second for the velocity, and we end up with no EMF being produced. To generate a sine wave, we take a coil, we rotate it 360 degrees, and we produce one sine wave or single phase power. No lines of flux are cut at zero degrees, 180 degrees, and 360 degrees. Therefore, no EMF is induced. 
When lines of flux are cut at right angles, maximum EMF is produced at 90 degrees and 270 degrees. You should be able to draw and fully label our sine wave from zero to 360 degrees. The maximum value is the value at the highest peak. The instantaneous value are smaller values occurring at specific instants on the sine wave. To define frequency, it's the number of cycles completed in one second. The average value is the average value of all the mid-ordinate values taken over half a cycle. The root mean square is the RMS, is the DC equivalent that produces the same amount of heat in the same amount of time as you would in an AC circuit. The form factor is the ratio of the RMS value to the average value. Now, before we attempt the next equation, we first need to prove how we convert radians to degrees. Now, one revolution is equal to 360 degrees, which is the same as two pi radians. To simplify that, to get radians on its own, it'll be 360 divided by two, which gives us 180 degrees, divided by pi gives us one radian, which is equal to 57,3 degrees. Therefore, to convert radians to degrees, you must always multiply by 57.3. In this following equation, E is the instantaneous value in volts, EM is the maximum value in volts, F is the frequency in hertz, small letter T is the time in seconds, and that symbol W is our angular velocity in radians per second. In the equation given, we need to first determine the maximum value of the EMF, and in this equation, the maximum value is 100 volts. To calculate the RMS and average value for the RMS, it's 0, 0.707 multiplied by 100. For the average value, it's 0, 0.637 multiplied by 100. Therefore, the RMS is 70,7 and the average is 63,7. To determine the frequency, we have the uh, angular velocity in radians per second. That is 314,28 divided by two and pi, and we end up with a frequency of 50 hertz. To calculate the period or time taken to complete one cycle, it is one over the frequency, therefore 0, 0,02 seconds. To calculate the instantaneous value of the EMF, 12 milliseconds after zero, therefore what would the instantaneous value be? at 12 milliseconds. To convert milliseconds into seconds, we divide by a thousand. Therefore, if we substitute all those values into the equation, don't forget to multiply by 57,3. Therefore, the instantaneous value is 58,9 volts in the negative half of the cycle. How much time would it take to reach 55 volts for the first time from zero? Therefore, we substitute the instantaneous value of 55 volts, and the unknown factor in this equation is time. To get time on its own, it'll be 55 divided by 100, which is equal to sine, and inside of the brackets, two times pi times the frequency of 50 times unknown, multiplied by 57,3. Then we take sine across, to become sine to the minus one, and to simplify that, to get time on its own, it's 33,367 divided by the angular velocity in radians per second, multiplied by 57,3, and we get 1,85 milliseconds. To calculate the ratio of form factor, it is the RMS over the average. To calculate the crest factor, it's the ratio of the maximum value over the RMS value. Now we're moving on to statically induced EMF and that is self-induced EMF. An alternating current passes through a single coil. The magnetic field generates an EMF in the same coil. This is also known as back EMF. Back EMF is the polarity which opposes that of the alternating current supply. For mutual induction, alternating current through one coil causes a magnetic field to induce an EMF in the second coil. Moving on to power in an AC circuit. 
and we're going to be taking a look at something called a power triangle. The power triangle consists of true power, reactive power, and apparent power. If we take a look at this beer jug, you'll notice that the foam represents our reactive power, which is wasted electricity. And the beer part, which is the part we actually drink, is the working part of electricity. And that represents our true power or real power. Now, the reactive power and the real power combined will give us the apparent power. To define these terms, true power is the actual power used in the circuit and the units is kilowatts. Reactive power is the power generated but not used and is wasted in the form of heat and the units is volts, amps, reactive. Apparent power is the total power of the circuit. The consumer pays for the power used and the power wasted and this is volts, amps. Power factor is represented by cos theta. To define power factor, it is the ratio of true power to apparent power. Now, a good power factor would range around about 0 0,8. A poor fact power factor would range around about 0 0,2. And perfect power factor, known as unity power factor, would be 1. The detrimental effects of poor power factor, thicker cables are needed. It reduces efficiency, it limits the output, more current is drawn, and it costs the consumer more money. In example 1.3, a single phase motor draws 0 0.75 kilowatts from a 220 volt supply. If the motor is operating at unity power factor, calculate the following. So to determine the current drawn by the motor, remember it's single phase circuit, therefore we do not use square root three. It is unity power factor, therefore cos theta is equal to one. So therefore the load current drawn from the supply is 750 watts divided by 220 volts and unity power factor. And that gives us 3,409 amps. To determine the phase angle by which the motor is operating, unity power factor cos theta equals one. To get the phase angle on its own, we take cos across. Therefore, the phase angle is zero degrees. To determine the reactive power of the motor, the reactive power is V line multiplied by I line multiplied by sine theta, which is the phase angle. 220 multiplied by 3,409. We substitute zero degrees into sine theta. Therefore, the volts amps reactive is zero. Moving on to three phase power, to generate a three phase circuit, we need three coils placed 120 degrees apart, which will produce three sine waves. We have a star connection, and here are three stator windings. They are bridged horizontally. We have a voltage, which is V phase across the live and the neutral, V line, which is from one phase to the other phase. And then we have a common point or a neutral point. For delta connection, it is bridged vertically and we only have three wires. There's no neutral connection. VL is equal to V phase for a delta connected motor. The advantages of three phase systems over single phase systems, there are two operating voltages, more power delivered, Three phase motors are cheaper, more efficient, and they are usually smaller in size. The formulas for three phase circuits for delta, VL is equal to V phase. For star, IL is equal to I phase. When working with the formulas for three phase circuits, we multiply by square root three. All values are line values unless otherwise stated, and we assume 100% efficiency if no efficiency is given. In example 1.4, a three phase delta connected motor draws 25 amps from a 380 volt supply at a power factor of 0 0.86 lagging. Calculate the following. To determine the input power, we would multiply by square root three because it's a three phase circuit. Therefore, square root three times the line voltage of 380 multiplied by the load current of 25 the power factor of 0.86, 
and we end up with a power of 14,15 kilowatts. To calculate the apparent power, the symbol is S, and we multiply by square root three, therefore 16,454 kilovolts amps. To determine the phase current of the motor for a delta connected motor, I phase would be equal to IL over square root three, and that would give us a phase current of 14,43 amps. Thanks for watching this video. Keep tuned, we're gonna be uh, making some more videos for this new curriculum. Don't forget to hit that like button. Thanks very much.